time. It is and always will be something we have to manage in the workplace. If we're going to take burnout and productivity seriously, which is what we say we are trying to do, time needs to be our friend, not our enemy. And yet it always seems to be so much our enemy. Not enough time for us to get everything done, too many priorities for our teams to accomplish, and our managers and leaders just seem to barely have any space in their calendars to talk. Time, 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 time. Even if we feel like we have a good relationship with it. I don't know, have you ever have you ever lied to yourself with that one? There always seems to be something, some opportunity, some occasion, where it just comes up shaky again, and we need to reevaluate. Our relationship with time at work is our topic today, and I have the perfect guest to help us with that. It's actually such a perfect guest that uh, he was on last year, and I thought I would repeat the episode because honestly, it's important. Hold on. Welcome back to Relationships at Work, the leadership guide to creating a workplace we love. I'm your host, Russell Lolliker is my name. Uh, I am a leader. I am a communications nerd. I've been doing both of those things for mm, a couple of decades, actually, now. I also have a lot of curiosity, a lot of curiosity about how we can make the workplace a better place for those that work in it. And this, this show, it's a great resource and a place to start. This week, while you're listening to this podcast, if you're listening to it right when it's being released, I am actually going to be off to connect with fellow content creators and podcasters, those podcast types, in Colorado at Podcast Movement. It's my, actually, it's my third time at the conference. Always a good time. Uh, I previously was down in Fort Worth in 2015 and Philadelphia in 2018, so I figured it was time for a catch-up. Plus, to be honest, I've never been to Colorado, so I thought it'd be a really cool opportunity to get down there and, uh, yeah, look at the temperature and it's going to be quite warm, which I didn't think Colorado got, but uh, probably just the first in many things I will learn about Colorado uh, when I get down there. So, of course, if you are there this week, if I'm mentioning podcast movement and you're standing there in a conference in Colorado, please come by and say hi. I love people. I love community. I mean, the show's called Relationships at work. So it's all about those relationships. So it'd be silly not to say, hey, come say hi. And because I'm away this week, I thought I'd reshare one of my favorite episodes of the show and one of the more popular ones, our relationship with time management with Mike Fardy. So full disclosure, I'm actually traveling to podcast movement with Mike. So it just felt destined that I'm like, you know what? Time management is always going to be a thing. It's always something we need to work on at every level of the employee experience. So why not share this podcast episode again? Because it's really always worth revisiting. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Mike actually is in the show. He said, if we don't have a good relationship with time individually or as an organization, time's going to have its way with us. Love that, Mike. I will actually, when I see you next time, I will say it to your face. It kind of just sums it all up. So in this episode, Mike helps us by talking us through mindset and tactics, why time management is actually the wrong way of looking at it, and maybe where we can start with overwhelm. And well, truthfully, there's a lot in this episode, and I'm thrilled to share it again. Over to Mike. And on the show... It's Mike Vardy, and here's why he is awesome. He is a highly regarded productivity strategist and time management specialist, multi-time author, who has his most recent being the book, uh, the ebook, Productivityist Playbook. He's a podcaster, speaker, repeatedly uh, named a top productivity expert on too many lists to name, and you can hear some of his expertise in Huffington Post, CBC Radio, LinkedIn Learning, and he's a good friend of this particular person right here, and someone that I... Uh, well, I have a quite high regard of Mike, right? I can call you Mike. Mike? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks, Russell. As long as uh, if you start calling me Michael or Mr. Vardy, it gets weird. Mike, Michael sounds like I'm in trouble. Michael sounds like I'm in trouble. 
and Mr. I have a Vardy. Stern face every time I say Michael. Well, and no one <laughs> and no one calls me Mr. Vardy, because uh, I almost feel like I'm in trouble if that happens too. At this point, like it's not like my daughter's friends go, "Hey, Mr. Vardy," they go, "Hey, Mike." Like that's what it is. So it, I, I think both of those, Michael, my full <laughs> given name, and Mr. Vardy, those two are like, "Oh, what I do? What's wrong?" And <laughs> And I've got like, and here's my demographic. I've got Arrested Development going in my head right now. Mm-hmm. And I've got Janet Jackson rapping in my head. So anybody who has their Mr. and their Mrs. and their demographic goes that direction, they'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, thanks for the being on the podcast, Mike. I'm not going to treat you any special. I am going to ask you the same question I ask all my guests, which is, of course, what is the best or worst employee experience you've ever had? I'd say the the, the best the best employee experience I ever had was working uh, at the Victoria Film Festival. I I had somebody that worked alongside me initially, and this has been a while ago. Um, and I brought them on board as the box office manager, but I always had in mind that they were going to do be able to fill the shoes of like operations, right? So I was already thinking about leaving at that point in time to start what I'm doing now. And uh, I wasn't sure that they were going to be able to do it. And they interacted with one of the, uh, there was a, a, some kind of um, gala event going on, I believe, or something like that. And someone came in and they wanted to buy a ticket to the gala, but for some reason they couldn't, or they didn't have a membership or what, what have you. And they really just wanted to go to the gala. And what this person did um, much probably to the chagrin of who was in charge, was they bought the membership for that person in that moment. So they diffused the situation, and they knew full well that this person was not going to be seeing some of the other more, um, let's say, fringe films that would be showing. They really wanted to go to this gala. And at that point in time, I kind of re- recognized, because I didn't even have to get involved, which is the best part. I just kind of watched it happen. And just that kindness, but also diffusing the situation, making everything kind of look, you know, for lack of a better term, like solid and uh, making it so that other people in line were going, what's going on? Like they really kept things going. Uh, I'm like, okay, well, if this person wants to do what I'm doing now, that, that, that action alone took care of it because they, they danced across like a weird line of, we're not supposed to do this sort of thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. And they did it with little hesitation. They they solved the problem. They came to, you know, they came to the the dance with a solution, and they weren't afraid to play the card. So that to me, you know, in terms of just employee to customer, and then employee to you know the people around them, because the the volunteers, well, I guess not employees, but the volunteers saw how this person reacted. So now all of a sudden they weren't just looking to me for guidance about things. Now they knew they could go to this person for guidance. So it was a really one of those moments where just one simple action had a bit of a cascading effect. Does that make sense? It does. And it's funny how huh, people don't think it's a reality of what they can do, they can't do, what permission they give themselves until they see it modeled in the behavior of the leaders around them. And we, we talk a good game. I mean, believe me, on this podcast, we mention a lot of, well, your values are on the poster, so it must be true. But I love hearing stories where people are actually walking the walk. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is it was like, I think it was like two bucks. So it wasn't like going to break yeah. the person's bank. It wasn't, and they didn't make a big deal out of it either because he, all, I mean, they also knew that uh, other members were there, p- potential members were there. And all of a sudden, that cascading effect of, hey, how come you paid for this person's? So they were very discreet about it too. So they solved the problem in the best way possible. And that gave me confidence. And like you said, like, you know, people around saw it goes, Oh, well, you know, this person's going to be good in not just, um, situations like this, but imagine if it's even more of a, a dire or problematic situation that all of a sudden the confidence in that person has also grown. So it's not just the modeling, but the confidence in, in the leadership, which, um, can be hit and miss sometimes. So that was an example in such a small, in- a small institution, a small instance where it just kind of radiated. So the topic today is our relationships with time at work, because my God, man, we have meeting problems. We have time management problems. We have uh, scope creep is a huge problem. Time not being respected. So I guess, how do you feel the current 
employee leadership relationship with time is based on your experience? Well, interestingly, I think that what we've gone through over the past three years has really altered the landscape in a way that I think was going to happen to some degree anyway. The idea of remote work, the idea of not so uh, so much, um, I wouldn't say accountability, but but uh, measurement on, hey, how long have you been here versus what are you delivering? There's no longer this quantitative element, or at least it's not as such a, a big barrier for leaders to say, well, I can't see them doing the work, so how do I know that I'm doing the work? They need to be in here from you know 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., that that is that that myth has been kind of you know compromised. Doesn't mean everybody's listening to it. It just means it's been compromised. So I I think the the other thing is is that time moved on during those whole that whole time, <laughs> that whole period. Like it didn't stop. So the idea of managing time, and that's why you know we you and I we you know we meet regularly and we talked about this this idea of like I told you I, I don't I don't think time management is an apt term. It's in the lexicon. It's what people use, but. Time will not be managed. Time has time moves on whether you want it to or not. It has its own flow, its own rhythm. And again, it's very personal. You know, one person experiences time then differently than another. So that's why uh, I would prefer that people try to forge better relationships with time and nurture those relationships. Because like dealing with people, um, if you are dealing with time in a, you know, rude or uh, detrimental manner, it will treat you the same way, either very obviously or very subtly. And and I think people, the same thing can happen with people, whether it's, you know, a, a customer or whether it's a colleague, right? So I think some of the things that, that we can work on um, is in order to, the, the biggest thing that people can do right now with time is use it as a a proper measuring stick. Use it as, okay, if you're having scope creep, w did we break things down enough? Did we did we break the project down into small enough particles where we're giving realistic timeframes to how long it takes to do certain things? Or are we just looking at the, the whole of it and not realizing, oh, there's a step in here that if we broke it out, it would actually be able to get done that much faster or we wouldn't get stuck as often. Um, but all of this, oddly enough, takes slowing down a little bit, being thoughtful and doing things like communicating clearly, not just via email or Slack or, you know, Microsoft uh, Office or any of those tools. The same goes for, um, you know, again, making plans and uh, communicating through meetings and all that stuff. We need to be more mindful and thoughtful about it because, again, uh, if we don't have a good relationship with time individually or as, as an organization, we, time will have its way with us. Mindset versus tactics. Now, on the podcast, I've spoken a lot on this, and I've butted heads with a few podcasts where I've actually been a guest on, where they're like, quick, give me five quick ways that employees can be empowered. I'm like, we have a problem if we don't get our heads right. What's your thoughts on mindset versus tactics? Because, I mean, there is still a place for both of them when it comes to time in work. Well, and you got, you got to remember, I started most of my online career working for outlets that talked about life hacks, for lack of a better term, right? So the next web, I was their light, TNW life hacks editor. I was the editor of lifehack.org, the managing editor at one point in time. I, I think that there's too much emphasis on tactics first because they are easier to measure than mindset. Again, any, especially the bigger the organization, the more, um, you know, tendrils it kind of has or the more, the more outlets and branches, it, numbers are the things that are universal. They're understood that, you know, they say numbers don't lie. Um, there is a lot of truth in that, right? So I think that the reason people say, you know, here's five ways to get through your email inbox um, is fine. But if you're spending all day in your email inbox and not getting other things done, your ultimate goal is to get through your email inbox just so you could say, I got to inbox zero and therefore it was a productive day. I would say, I would downright, you know, insist that you weren't productive because you only focused on one area of your work and it may not have even been the most important area of your work. So I think mindset, again, that idea of slowing down is a big part of it. The idea of, you know, being mindful, it's right in there is because it, it allows us to make better decisions around things like where our attention will go, 
what our plans look like for the day, what tactics to use in this scenario of which versus which ones don't work. I mean, Cal Newport wrote in his book, A World Without Email, he talked about the nuances of things like autoresponders and canned responses and things like that. Well, an out of office, you know, reply just done in a blanket sense can send one message to one person, but another message to somebody else. And that in and of itself is essentially a tactic that you may have misplayed or misused. Uh, it may require several autoresponders, maybe those that aren't in your contacts, maybe those that are your colleagues, maybe there's a different, but you have to think those things through, which involves slowing down. And we don't live in a world that really likes it when you slow down because the productivity mindset is to create, uh, either have the power or quality to create an abundance. That's what the current, the, the, the definition is when realistically the inabundance is a fairly new addition to that definition. Being productive was just about being able to produce. Didn't matter necessarily. The emphasis wasn't on make it a lot. It was just produce. So hopefully a balance of quality and quantity. So I think that, that that's the thing is, is tactics tend to, fo they're, they're the closer um, avenue to quantitative productivity, whereas mindset is the long road to qualitative. And that's where I think we, we, there's no immediate ROI on it. So that's why it doesn't get the focus it should. Who's responsible for all this? Because as much as I know, I've got my many lists over here and my list over there and the journal over here, but then there are other groups in the organization who may have asks of me that totally mess up this productivity I had planned. So is it the responsibility of the individual to push back or is it the responsibility of the organization to understand workloads, flows, and so forth? Where's the push and the pull? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's both. It really is both. Um, you don't, I mean, change often is a result of conflict, right? Sometimes that conflict is very um, covert and sometimes it's very overt, right? And what you'll need to do is if it's so as if an individual is looking at their list and they get an email from one of their superiors saying, Hey, can you do this? And they look at their list and they see 14 things on it already. If the person getting that demand was to reflect back, well, you've given me these other 14 things, which, which one is the one that's the most pressing? you know, a variety of things will happen. You're opening the door to conversation. Either the superior goes, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, put that third. Or this overrides all. Thanks for letting me know. They're not really thinking about all the things they put on your list, by the way. Anybody that emails you is not thinking about your list. They're thinking about their thing, whether it's a list, whether it's an of ask course. or whatever, right? But the other response could be, hey, I don't care. You've got all these things to do. Add this to, the there's so much messaging in that communication. One is one of compassion, and one is one of, you know, just abject dismission. Like they, they don't, and, and that sends messages um, like maybe I shouldn't be here much longer. Maybe I need to get better about protecting my, uh, you know, my, my boundaries. Maybe I need to look at what, what I signed up for. And, you know, that's why quiet quitting is becoming a, a more a viral thing. It's always been kind of a thing, but the, you know, the term and the term in and of itself has a whole bunch of problems with it. But so it, it's a problem on both sides. Now, if, if it's the organization takes the lead on it through things like professional development, which, you know, every rock solid organization has a percentage of their annual budget designed for professional development, either for themselves as a, as a leadership team or for the entire industry or, or rather organization. So it's up to them to kind of say, okay, well, what can we learn? How can we get better? You know, what the numbers are going down. Why? It's not always because you're not making enough stuff or your prices are off. Sometimes it has to do with things that you can't measure that easily. And that's where conversations come into play. And really, um, a lot of this comes down to just managing expectations through clear communications, you know, and through that, you can figure out whether expectations are being met, whether people are being, you know, kind of violated is not the right, it's the word I'm going to use, but, you know, they're being taken advantage of or, you know, and there will be some people who are just, you know, coasting, right? So, and there's never going to be a perfect balanced, when we say balanced, I'm using air quotes, uh, organization, because balanced 
you know, if you're going to say perfect balance, there's no such thing. It's just balanced because you're going to have, quote, slackers. You're going to have overachievers. And then you're going to have people who just want to go in, do the work, do it well, and leave. And that's it. And then they want to have balance in their lives overall. So that communication is key. But when someone says, well, is it my job or is it the the employer's job? Uh, I'd say it's both. The employee, employer has one distinct route that they should take. And the employee, frankly, no one's going to give you the tool you want every single time. So you have to come kind of prepared with, hey, how am I, what's my framework? How do I try to get things done? And work with the tools that are given to you because that those tools are going to be objective, which is not the same as the way you're going to work, which is going to be subjective. I know this is a big question because it's very personalized, but I'm, I'm hoping you can give us some tips on this. Mm-hmm. How would you recommend an employee sitting here going overwhelmed, burnout? Where do I even start? How do you set them up for success when it comes to managing their days a little bit better when it comes to time? So if they're feeling overwhelmed, overwhelm is often a combination of one or all or a combination of, again, three these three things. Overchoice, overcommitment, or overload, right? So overchoice, I have too many things to decide which to do. Well, in that case, that's a we need to take something off their plate, give them less choices, either by removing things via deadlines. Hey, this isn't due for a while, you know, and, and you can hide those things. That's where software comes in handy. Hey, I only want to see the things that are due in the next 30 days. Great. Or I only want to see things that are due for this project. Fantastic. Like you can do that with different types of software. Uh, you could even do that with just, hey, have a folder on your desktop that's next 30 days and everything you need to work on is in there. Like you can get that simple uh, if, if need be. Uh, Over commitment is almost done through, again, those high achievers. They commit to all these things and then they, they run out of room. They don't have enough bandwidth. In that, those instances, what has to happen is people have to, you know, that's where leadership can come in and say, okay, well, you've taken on too much. How do we ease some of your load and teach you a lesson at the same time that, you know what, you don't need to do all this. Why did you feel you needed to, you needed to do that? You, that you needed to do this, things like that. Um, and then finally, um, overload, which is a combination of not just, it's often not, you know, over choice or over commitment. It's a tendency for just the constant barrage, right? So overload is an inability to, you know, kind of function with the capacity that's being thrown at you. So as far as I'm concerned, one of the easiest way to do that is to get your email communications and your general organization communications under control. And that can happen from either side of the equation. Organizationally, you could say email is for external only. Only use email for external. Use our internal comms, whether that's Slack, whether that's, uh, what, what does Microsoft use again? It's Teams, Teams I think. Teams, yeah. yeah, like you, or whatever tool you're using, all of our internal communications are done that way. And then you create like this team task management charter that kind of provides some guidelines. So that way they know, oh, okay, well, this is where I look for these things. The other thing is you teach people how to batch their communications so that you're not emailing them or communicating with them every five, 15 minutes, you know, constantly throughout the day. Instead, you're capturing them and then you're sending them maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, depending on the scenario. And again, that's going to be very personalized. From the other side, you could start that as an individual. You could say, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm actually going to start using the internal communication tool the way it's meant to be used. And I'm only going to use the, you know, I'm going to use email for, you know, attachments and things like that, that we don't do there, but I'm going to run it by my leadership team and I'm going to tell them why. Hey, Instant messaging is for urgent stuff that we need to deal with right away. I recognize that. Email is for more long form stuff, maybe stuff that's coming from external event. I'm going to start handling it that way. Is that something that you're okay with? Like, or, you know, and, and have a conversation around that. Um, I remember doing, uh, 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 I think it was uh, for a large, really large organization, and they were having a lot of trouble with email, just onslaught of emails. And I said, number one, you know, I shared kind of the dividing and conquering thing. Number two, don't try to get to inbox zero every day. It's a, it's a losing battle. And then, you know, I kind of said, number three, after a certain hour, don't answer the emails. Like just stop. I mean, there's a law in France that does like, it's illegal for corporations to ask employees after a certain time. I think it's 5 PM to answer and emails. Weekends. Yeah. And, and weekends. weekends. And that to me is uh, the fact that government has to intervene on that, you know, 
people can argue, well, the government shouldn't be here. The gov- if the government has to intervene on that, it's clearly a problem because they very rarely would intervene in a private sector, even, even in a country such as France, which has a reputation for having those tendencies. That takes a lot. So I would, I would argue that um, those are the things that you, that you can do from an organizational standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint to kind of figure out, okay, I'm overwhelmed. I'm feeling burnt. And once you're in burnout, it, it, there's other interventions that I'm not an expert in that you would have to uh, – Clark Gaither talks about this stuff a lot. Uh, he talks about burnout and things like that. And you don't even know you're in it sometimes when you're in it. So if those tactics that I mentioned don't work – you may need to go a step deeper, a step further. Got a question uh, from our Relationships at Work community on Facebook. Kirsten Bree asked, how do we set better boundaries with our work time, especially with to-do lists that can never be totally cleared up so that we feel better about the time spent at work versus home and leisure? Thoughts? So so my thought is, the way I, I've done it in the past is, there's, there's a couple of, of ways. One is I use daily themes to kind of organize and structure my days, right? So like today is Thursday as we're recording this. It's my training day. So things I did today was I read a book. I did some uh, learning about a certain platform that I use for sending out tweets. Like I spent some time really filling my brain with that stuff. But then I also, you know, watched a documentary here at home. And I so I, I won't just apply learning to my business stuff, I'll apply it to home stuff as well. So when you're choosing like a daily theme, it shouldn't be like, you know, reports. I mean, you're not probably going to fly, but file a bunch of reports for home, Uh, but finance, you might like, you might want to have a financial day where you focus on that. And again, it's a very personal choice and it all depends on the way your week flows as to what days you might choose for what. But another thing that, that I, and I worked with an architecture firm on this and they were, there was a, a particular person who was like, I, never feel like I'm ahead. I never feel like I'm going to get my to-do list done, which I said, well, you never will. Like your to-do list will be done when you're done. Like that's essentially what it is. So now that you know that, she goes, yeah, but I always do other people's things and then I never get to my stuff. And I said, okay. So in your task app or your bullet journal or whatever you're, you're using, create like at the end of every task, ask yourself this question and then answer it. Is this a task for me or is this a task for someone else? If it's a task solely for someone else, indicate it with some kind of indicator. Maybe uh, maybe like two people or an, an E for everyone or A for anyone, whatever. Um, or uh, if it's for you and you know it's for you, signify that with like your initials next to it. So that way your brain doesn't need to look at the overwhelming list of things, but it can now look at the the signifier, the identifier, what you've coded those tasks to be and say, oh, these are mine. I'll do mine later in the day. Let's say post lunch when everyone else has already had their stuff taken care of. So from like one to five, my focus will be on my stuff. So let me just look at the MV tasks from that point onward. But in the mornings, you're focusing on the other things. You're focusing on what you're you're spending more time in email. You're spending more time dealing with what everybody else wants. And by virtue of doing that on a repeated basis, you should be able to, you know, keep the dogs at bay. You go to lunch and then you can get your stuff. It doesn't mean you're not going to do their stuff in the afternoon. It might mean that you check email a little less. You might do, you might create some boundaries around that, but now all of a sudden it's like my stuff gets focused. So that way, when you start your work day, you're not going, okay, what am I going to do today? The, the, the question becomes, okay, well, what do people want from me before lunchtime today? Boom. And you focus on that. And then after lunch, like, okay, what did I want to do today? Once you, once you own that, then just like we were talking about having a relationship with time, that's some give and take right there. Not just with time, but with the people around you. And you're creating this relationship where you know and time knows what you should be doing at this very specific time. Not in the very specific sense. You're going to have some broad strokes in there. But by knowing that, your brain starts to create that pattern. So it knows, hey, it's 1 o'clock time for me to focus on my stuff first and foremost. Oh, Russell gave me something. No problem. I'll deal with that quick. Where do I go now? Oh, right. Back to my stuff. Like it just be, it becomes more fluid. Less friction, more flow. When you have boundaries, it's weird constraints help because they they create boundaries but you need to have them you need to kind of have be like goldilocks and like make sure they're just right and the reason that that worked for this person is they were in a role that was very much a, an assistant role 
you might want, if you're a CEO or at a higher, you might flip it. Hey, the mornings I do my stuff in the afternoon, I'm all yours. Right? So you could, that's, that's a way to do it, but you don't have to create such solid boundaries that it's so rigid that you don't have any room to breathe. And then by the way, when you do that, I guarantee it'll fall into place with home stuff, right? Because if you do the afternoon stuff for you and then you cut your cut off at the knees at five, then you don't answer those emails after that. Or you try it with one person and see what happens or two people or a group of people. You do some experimentation. I would bet <laughs> most of the time, those emails that get sent to you after work, they can keep till the next morning when you're going to give into other people's demands and do what they want you to do to start off the day. So going down the path of personalization is very trial and error. Yeah, I would say with anything. I mean, when you think about it, uh, the food you intake, right? Like the, like the food you eat, different foods react differently to every single person, right? You know, my wife cannot do dairy or gluten. She, it's pretty clear. She's, she said like, look what happens when I, so she just doesn't and it doesn't, I don't react that way. I have, you know, but I also can't eat everything I used to eat when I was in my twenties. So things change, things evolve. And that's why you need to experiment. There's going to be some things that are timeless, right? Things that you won't need to experiment with too much. In fact, the things that we do tend to experiment with, we shouldn't like sleep time. Like if you're a natural night owl, you should be at the very least leveraging that by saying, you know what, I'm going to do my high energy stuff later in the day. But the last thing you should be doing is, you know what, I need to become a morning person. That's like fighting biology, like it, it, like your biological clock. You can do it. It won't be pretty and it won't necessarily stand the test of time either. Good news is, is as we age and Dr. Michael Bruce writes about this in The Power of When, our circadian rhythms do adjust earlier a bit. But I can tell you as a night owl myself, I'm still not going to bed till one in the morning. So yeah, there, there, it is trial and error, but make sure you're experimenting on the right things. Like, hey, I wanna cut off email. So at 5 p.m., but I know my boss is like hardcore. So I will maybe answer their emails, but nobody else's. Or maybe I won't answer theirs for two nights and see what happens or three days. Like those are the kind of experiments I'm talking about. Not, you know what I need to do? I need to get up first thing in the morning or I need to, it's New Year's, time to take that yoga class. Like there's, we tend to t make massive extreme, try massive extreme experiments because they're sexy. And they, you know, and there's the, but the small ones, like, let me just not answer that email from that one person on that very particular project. They're like, well, Mike, that's so narrow in scope, but yeah, but it, when it works, it's like, you know, what if I don't eat cheese anymore? What would happen? Oh, wow. Okay. I guess maybe I shouldn't eat cheese. And by the way, that doesn't just go for people with dietary restrictions either. Some, I mean, I quit soda pop for a year, solid. And I'm, I'm no longer you know, addicted to it because of it. I don't know that I ever was. I just kind of just, it was a habit, right? So that's the thing is I think if you start doing stuff like that and, and realize that trial and error is going to be part of the process, in fact, it may very well be the process, then you're going to be in a much better place than if you just go, you know what, I, this needs to be one and done. That's where we get back into life hacks and things like that that aren't, that aren't consistent or sustainable. And back to the relationship metaphor, don't get too married to them either. Yeah. I mean, as much as you're personalizing it, as you said, say that demanding boss that you had to tweak your productivity to help them. Maybe you get a new boss who's way more laid back. Suddenly you have more time and less demands. You should be reassessing and auditing as you go as well. Yep. And, and again, that goes with things like energy levels, like Testing the waters, letting people know, hey, you know what? I'm not at my best in the morning. You know this. So I'm going to focus on that stuff later in, you know, the day. Cool with that? Like that communication piece is so important because number one, you're not only creating that, you know, communication pattern with your colleagues, you're also telling yourself that stuff and you're advocating for yourself, which will also improve your relationship with time. Because if, if it all goes well, then time knows and you know, right? If it doesn't go well, time knows and you know. But when there's so much uncertainty and ambiguity, that's when you run into issues because there's no trust there. And if there's no trust there, if there's no trust in a relationship, how solid and good is that relationship going to be? Doesn't matter if it's your spouse, your best friend, or your organization. Absolutely. Or with yourself. Yeah, or your time.
or your time. Ah, look at you pulling it back. Nicely done. So we've done, we've bought the flowers. We've bought the chocolates. We showed up to our date. We've got all the tactics of this relationship working. Are we ready to commit to this relationship? Ah, see, I'm pulling this. This metaphor is working for me. So what's the mindset we need to have? I'm hearing curiosity uh, a lot when it comes to testing the waters and, and personalization. What other ways do you think people should be thinking differently to have better relationships with their time? So don't think about productivity as efficiency and effectiveness. That's a big one. Speed and, and, and you know, quantity. Things, things that uh, productivity isn't that. The term productivity is probably not the best term anymore either. Because number one, it means different things to different people. I remember when um, someone subscribed to my newsletter and they're from Poland and they said, I really love your work, but I was hesitant to subscribe to the productivity list because productivity where, you know, where when I grew up was a bad, it was a measuring stick determining how well we were treated by our government. I'm like, yeah, I never thought about it that way because if they didn't produce enough, then that was a reflection of what they would get, how they were treated, all that stuff. I think that that the mindset needs to be, and I'm hearing this more about like the term like slow productivity, which again, I think is going to backfire to on some, I think it's going to appear like, oh, so really just be lazy. That's what's going to happen. It's going to flip to like, oh, they're lazy or they're, they're not confident or competent enough, or they're, it's a rebel, it's a rebellion against, you know, Taylorism and things like that, which goes way back. Um, Productivity at its core is about the active linking of your intention and your attention. So if you start to think about it that way, stop using the word to do maybe and start thinking about things like intentions or t- even tasks, right? Uh, to do doesn't have a lot of power behind it. If you have tasks, there's a little bit more meat on the bone, intention maybe even more meaning behind it. I think that when you start thinking about it that way, it's like, well, I intend to do this. How am I going to pay attention to it? Which is the key. Because if you intend on, you know, showing your date a good time, but you don't pay attention to that, then all of a sudden, is that relationship going to even have a chance to bloom or, or, you know, come to, you know, whatever, whatever you want to get out of the relationship, it's going to be much harder if you're not paying attention to it. And so I think that that if we start thinking about the things that we're trying to do, needing and wanting to do as intentional, like these are intentions, how am I going to pay attention to it? Then we repeat that pattern again and again. Then we get things like speed, quantity, efficiency, and quality will get better too because we're doing it over and over and over again. If we start there, then I think everything else starts to starts to build off of that. How do I pay attention to this big book project? Well, maybe I need to break it down into its smallest steps because I've never written a book before. Okay, why am I doing this? My intention is to write a book. Oh, that's why. Like those kind of things. And yes, initially they take more time to do and they take more energy to do and things that you might you might feel backlash from. Well, shouldn't you be doing this instead? And it won't be from others necessarily all the time. It could be internally. Uh, that's where that's where the battle begins, is the battle between like, I just want to do what I'm you know, supposed to do. And the other's like, well, no, we are doing what we're supposed to do. We're just going to try to do better. And uh, that's where the battle begins So and, and where it often ends. So that's that's the mindset. If you can shift productivity away from efficiency and effectiveness, realize those are byproducts, and go towards intention and that tension, you're already going to be a, a good few steps down the road. Just keep going. You talked earlier about leaders coming in and being able to help their staff going, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I'm like, I've never seen an organization that's able to do that because the leaders are too busy. They're also slammed and have no time for anything to help anybody else work their time management. So where do we want to get to? If, if, what's your utopia, Mike? Uh <laughs> where I'd like to get is, you know, when a leader comes in, they need to get their, they need to have an understanding of their expectations in the first place. They need to prioritize. They need to know some of this stuff because if they don't, then you're right. They can't help the people that they're trying to help by the same token 
people who are in the organization that are maybe not in the leadership roles, they are probably at the point, and I've, that's who I've helped mostly, is those people who are at the point where like, I'm not getting the help I need. I need to get a bit of an edge or a bit of, even just a bit of a leg up or just I want to stay afloat. And that's often the people that I end up talking to because they're the ones that are, they don't have anybody else to fall back on. Like if, if those tasks don't get done, no one does them. And so leadership, like everything travels downstream, right? Whereas with leaders, I'm not saying they don't want that stuff to get done, but because they are, and I hate that term busy, it's more that like there's a lot of demands on them and they don't, they don't, they're not good with boundaries. Not, I wouldn't say they in general, but you know, there are some that are not good with boundaries, uh, both <laughs> creating their own and then respecting the boundaries of others be, as a result. I think what happens is where I would, where I'd love to see is that leaders, you know, kind of went into it with, okay, we have all this technology that's going to speed things up, but are we speeding the right things up? Like how, like these tools should help us slow the right things down. And that will allow us to make more thoughtful, uh, sound decisions around what we should be doing at all, living according to our values. And there's simple, and, and, the, and the, the idea behind this isn't uh, that you have to make it challenging to do. You could very easily, I mentioned the whole idea of like self-serving and serving mode, like your name and everybody else's name. You could legitimately put beside a task, if you're a leader, this is a value. So it's, it, if we do this task, it leads up to our values and just put like a V. Or if you're really concerned about money, hey, each of these tasks has a three, a one to $5 rating. This one's a $1 task. This one's a $3 task. This one's a $5 task. Okay, this is the one that we need to focus on. Like you can create shorthand and code, almost like little mental flashcards that our brain can go, oh, I'm going to focus on these three to four to $5 bill ones, not the $1 ones. I'll outsource that. Or, you know, we just won't do that. Right. And then passing that on to the people that are in the organization, but for the shared value stuff, if you value, you know, if you value the bottom line, Hey, everybody, you need to put a dollar figure. What you think is beside this task, or I'm going to give it to you. And then, you know, Oh, this is a $1 task. It's going to be way, way down the line. You can create these little simple symbols or signatures or filtration, you know, units, whatever you want to call them to kind of force your function down the path that you want it to go. I think if people started to think more in those terms, as opposed to let me check off as many boxes as I can today. Let me go through all my emails as many as I can get to inbox zero and I'll be back tomorrow to do the same damn thing again. And that's kind of where we're at. And there's no reason for us to be there. It just takes, it, it is, it's, it's, it takes effort. It takes, you know, a level of, bravery to a degree and i mean i make it sound like it's this massive undertaking and it can be but it's like anything what do they say how do you steer a culture ship slowly like that's with big organizations that's what happens and i i think that it, it doesn't take much um to get started it does take a lot to keep it going i'm going to finish with my favorite question for you mike vardy which is what's one simple thing people can do right now to improve their relationships at work? Um, I would say the one thing they can do is to, if they, it, let's, let's use a tactical piece. I'll give them a tactical piece. Talk, send an email out to your colleagues that you contact the most, the ones that you're going to top, your, your top three, and ask them how frequently you would like they would like to receive emails from you daily, like based on whatever. And you can create whatever that, whatever that sounds like to you. Hey, you know what, Russell? Uh, I know we work a lot together, but I don't want to disrupt you when you're in flow. So let's, let's figure out when we can, when I should send you an email or an instant message or et cetera, so that you can keep doing what you're here to do. I keep doing what I'm here to do, but we know we're on the same page. That right there is a, win-win. It's a win-win. Um, whether you get exactly what you want out of it, it's still a win because now you understand. You you know, I mean, and, and having that certainty is super important because people are just by default, the default is who cares? Let's just email. Oh, I got something on mine. Let's email it. If you do that, that shows some thoughtfulness, some care. And again, you'll hear from them what they want. You'll, they'll hear from what you want. And whether they follow through or not, or whether you follow through or not, there's now a relationship. 
if you want to make it great, you'll follow through on whatever they want and, and they'll do the same for you. And then just build from there. Hey, let's go to colleague number two, colleague number three. I would start with three colleagues and then expand from there. That I think is a tactical one. And I think it embodies the, the, the mindset one too, which is what's my intention? Not just for me, but for my organization to deliver quality, to put great stuff out there into the world for our customers, for the people that, okay, how do I pay attention to that? I know, like what's some little things that I can do that will make a big impact? Uh, if you think about it that way, then I think you're going to be in a much better, you're going to have a much better, much better relationship, not just with your colleagues, but with, again, with the time that you have. And both of those, both those things I've shared, uh, take care of that. That's Mike Vardy helping us have a little better relationship with our time at work. He's an internationally renowned productivity expert. You want more from him, go to productivityist.com, sign up to his workshops. The man has books. There is a cavalcade of content from that man to help you a little bit better. So thanks again, Mike, for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Russell. I had a great time. That's it. That's all. Another episode of Relationships at Work in the Can. Uh, how did you like this reposted episode of Time Management at Work? Mike's great. The man knows his stuff. Uh, I've been I've been a friend of Mike's for a long time, but I've also been a fan of his work for also a very long time. He's one of my uh, key resources in how I try to navigate things and productivity in my work. So if you haven't, I can't state enough, check out Productivityist. His stuff's really, really great. And, and for this show, if you've enjoyed this and you think time management is something that <laughs> we all need to be working on, maybe you have a friend that could be a little better at it, Share this episode, whether in an email, conversation, however you distribute information, I will leave it up to you for that one. But uh, yeah, just helping the podcast grow is always important as we're trying to nudge the needle a little bit further and get it into a few more ears and eyes. So yeah, thank you for your help. I really appreciate that. Take care.